Hi, my name is Dr. Yuri Burstyn. I'm a veterinarian in Vancouver, BC, and I'd like to welcome you to my series of practical skills for pet owners. Hi everyone, thank you for joining me. This video is an update to my COVID-19 in your pets, what you need to know video. I'm making it on March 25th and I made my last video about two weeks ago. So things are evolving rapidly, of course, throughout the world. So I thought I'd make a little update uh, to discuss three major points I touched upon in that video. One is health risk to your pets, two is proper veterinary visit protocols, and three is masks, <laughs> and should you wear them? <laughs> TLDR, no, uh, unless you're infected. So uh, I have my little self-isolation expert here helping me with making this video in the way that only a cat can. Uh, Mr. Pirate might be joining us a little bit later, huh? maybe. Uh, but yeah, yeah, let's get into it. So first of all, uh, can pets, can dogs and cats transmit COVID-19? The answer is still no. There have been one or two dogs worldwide where somebody tested them for COVID-19, whatever that means. I'm not sure what tests were used or how they were implemented, and they got a positive and it made it into the news. But uh, as of today, there's still absolutely no evidence that cats and dogs can get affected by COVID-19 or that they can transmit it to humans. Where are you going, darling? So I'm not sure what tests were used. It doesn't actually say in the articles what methodology was employed. And uh, of course, veterinarians aren't properly trained on how to collect these tests. So even though we are having a few positives come out, I think most of them came out of Hong Kong. Um, it doesn't really ring as an issue to me because, you know, with the virus being spread throughout the world right now, if it was going to be uh, consistently able to survive on dog's fur, we would have seen reports out of Italy or United States or Canada or a variety of other countries detecting it, and we haven't really. Um, and of course, again, there's also the collection issue. You know, if the veterinarian or the staff who are collecting or handling the samples have a subclinical infection of COVID-19, they could just be contaminating the samples with their own uh, exhaled viral RNA. So uh, at this point, there's no real solid evidence that it can really uh, survive on animals and absolutely no proof that it can be that, it, that the virus can be transmitted uh, between humans via a cat or a dog. Of course, as we know, the virus can survive for a few hours on like metal or plastic surfaces, but we have to remember that the fur of an animal is actually a much more hostile environment to viruses than metal or plastic. There's a dynamic immune component to skin and fur that actually kills viruses and bacteria also fur is being shed constantly. So at this point, there's really no um, concern about animals transmitting the virus. And in fact, during this period of social distancing, having a pet nearby can be a great comfort and can often be the only social interaction people have. So uh, not only do we not want people to um, be concerned about being close to their pets, but in fact, many of the SPCAs around the world are encouraging people to take animals home uh, this is a great time for adoption because you're going to be at home a lot. You have spent all the time you need to training your puppy or your kitten. So it's actually a fantastic time to do that. So yeah, if an, somebody is infected by COVID-19 and they sneeze on their dog and you pet it right afterwards, sure, you could get droplets that they sneezed out onto your hand and then infect yourself. That's possible. But, you know, that is a very contrived and unlikely scenario. Well, to be fair, you know, I'm the kind of person that when I see dogs outside, my first thing is to go over there, introduce myself and see if I can pet them. And I have had a hard time not doing that when I go out recently. <laughs> you know, <laughs> avoiding humans, no problem. I remember to maintain my two meters social distancing. Uh, but when I see a dog, I, there's always that instinct to just go be like, ah, ah, no, 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 can't do it today. No, have to let that beautiful husky walk by without letting him sniff my hand. It's tough, but hey, we all got to do our part, right? Now, people have asked me about ferrets in the comments section. Um, and honestly, I have no idea if ferrets can carry or transmit COVID-19. I don't know that anybody does right now. Um, they certainly have receptors in their lungs that are very similar to human lung receptors through which the virus enters, but that doesn't actually mean that they can be infected. It just means they might be a useful model for drug research or vaccine research or something. So I don't know that anybody really has the answer on ferrets, but cats and dogs, we can be pretty certain, are not a risk factor. So Mr. Pirate is going to join me for the next section, or at least as much of it as he wants to stick around for. Uh, so how often should you go to the vet? Now, we just got some new directives last night from the Canadian Veterinary Medical Association. Uh, obviously, this will not apply to you directly if uh, you live in a different country than Canada. However, um, the response between veterinary medical associations has been pretty uniform. Uh, they're generally trying to get vets designated as an essential service, so we may stay open in event of lockdown, and in most jurisdictions this has happened. And the latest guidelines that have been produced do recommend 
avoiding vet visits for healthy animals that simply need their annual health check and vaccine visit. So if you have a healthy pet at home that's young, has no issues, and is just due for their annual health check, uh, in the interest of social distancing, it is probably better if you stay at home. Now, puppies and kittens still need their puppy and kitten vaccines. Remember, the goal of these guidelines is to protect human health and through appropriate social distancing. However, having a parvovirus or rabies outbreak will actually uh, cause more human interactions, more vets visits, and a lot more uh, health issues in the general public uh, than simply coming in for a regularly scheduled vaccine appointment. So puppies and kittens still need their routine vaccines because we don't want to be dealing with a disease outbreak in our pet population in a couple months. The other stipulation is for animals who are sick or in distress, of course you should still come to the veterinarian. Again, as long as we have that essential service designation and are able to stay open, uh, we should be fulfilling our professional duty uh, to maintain animal welfare and prevent animal suffering. And we're, we're there for you as long as we're able to be. Now, of course, there is going to be some gray zones in any directive. In this case, from my perspective, the gray zone is geriatric animals. So, um, for example, the American Association of Feline Practitioners recommends health checks on cats over the age of eight, designates them as geriatrics. With dogs, it's less clear, but, um, you know, to lean on the side of caution, I would say animals over 10, I would treat as older animals. And we have to remember that a health check for an older animal isn't the same as going in for your annual physical as a human, right? A human, you go to the doctor for your annual physical once you're over a certain age, you're like, yeah, doc, I feel great, you know, just being conscientious, want to have a checkup, want to, you know, do the routine screening tests. It's very straightforward. With animals, we have to remember that, you know, they, we as veterinarians can detect problems that you as an owner cannot. We can hear heart murmurs, we can feel lumps in the kidneys and bowels that might be causing the animal back pain, but they have no way of telling us and they're signative of cancer. So we can detect health issues that owners cannot detect at home. So with geriatric health exams in animals, it's not really uh, the equivalent of a routine physical for a human. It's more like we're screening a population of patients which we know has disease, and we're screening them for disease, again, trying to get that early diagnosis, early identification in place so they can be managed in a cost-effective manner. Because of course, the earlier you detect an illness, you know, the easier and cheaper it is to manage, and the, also the more effective it is to manage. So early diagnosis is absolutely key. And uh, unfortunately, if we stop taking our older pets to the vet or don't do proper follow-up on health conditions, we're not really gonna be achieving uh, social distancing. Because what's gonna happen is these animals are gonna start getting sick because they aren't receiving routine health care, and then instead of coming to your vet visit at 4 p.m. on the Thursday that is scheduled and organized ahead of time, you're gonna be coming to a vet visit at 5.30 p.m. on a Friday as the clinic's about to close, uh, making it very hard to maintain any kind of isolation protocols, or worse, you're gonna end up at the emergency clinic, you know, three o'clock in the morning on Sunday, uh, where you're stuck for three or four hours in a room full of sick people and animals, or more likely these days, sitting in your car for four hours in the middle of the night, waiting for the nurse to come and take your pet inside. Uh, an awful experience, much, much more expensive uh, for you, and also much, much more stressful for your pet, and much less likely to have a good clinical outcome, i.e., they're way more likely to die and suffer uh, if you just wait till things become an emergency. So again, routine healthcare, preventative healthcare, we know uh, reduces the risks of illness, reduces the cost of illness management, reduces it both the patient's cost in terms of suffering, and in your case, the client cost in terms of exposure, because again, planned exposures during a regular vet visit is way easier to handle than an unplanned exposure uh, during an emergency clinic visit in the middle of the night, uh, again, where you you're probably in a place with a ton of other people who are also there for emergency visits. So my recommendation for cats and dogs over 10 years old, uh, which I believe is consistent with the CVMA guidelines, is to maintain regular health checks. Probably should be twice a year at that point, uh, or more often if your pet has a chronic health condition. And of course, if your pet is ill, keeping up with their um, regularly scheduled treatments and visits, that is actually gonna mitigate and minimize the amount of uh, COVID exposure and help you maintain social distancing at, at, as much as possible given the constraints that you're facing if you have an ill pet. And of course, there's always going to be some judgment on the owner's part. You know, if you have a pet who's 10 years old but looks fantastic, has had a health check within the last year, looks great, yeah, you can stay at home. You know, if your 
cat hasn't been to the vet in three years and suddenly starts vomiting more or your dog suddenly starts not wanting to go on walks, you should probably go to the vet. And actually I have a video on how to tell if your cat is sick. I'll throw a link to it down in the description below. Uh, it'll be right next to the description for the original COVID-19 and your pets what you need to know video. So we're going to rely a little bit on your discretion, a lot on your cooperation. Uh, and again, if you have a young healthy animal, skip the regular vaccine visits. You can always catch up once the lockdown is over. Uh, but again, skipping regular geriatric visits and management visits for ill animals is probably going to be counterproductive. It'll probably just land you at the emergency clinic uh, at an inconvenient time. And speaking of which, uh, most veterinary hospitals, I think, in the world, certainly with the clinics that I run, um, are now moving towards a drop-off policy, which is something I actually love doing anyways and we've done in the past for our clients who can't come in for, for a consult. Um, that is, you know, you drop off your pets at the door and uh, they get admitted. Luckily, we can deal with our patients without having to be exposed directly to humans at all. And then the vets communicate with the, you know, the clients using phone or email. Um, that way, we can still provide good quality health care for your pet without having that face-to-face -face exposure risk. And that's just uh, really, we're lucky that way that we can work with animals and not directly with humans. But we do ask for people's cooperation while we do this. You know, please drop off your pets as we tell you to. Please be on time for your appointments because they're staggered to avoid crowding, to minimize human-human interactions. Uh, please realize that obviously we're not going to be able to be as thorough in our communication over the phone as we are in person. You know, uh, as my clients know, I often spend 30 or 40 minutes just chatting in the consult room and, make, and providing education and getting a better history on the pets. So we're going to be a little bit limited in that regard, but we can still provide high quality health care with just a few modifications to workflow. So hopefully that's an update on uh, visitation protocols. And again, this is an evolving situation. It might change day to day, week to week. So it's always good to just check with your family veterinarian before going in to see what their preferred protocol is and to see if maybe the Canadian Veterinary Medical Association or whatever medical association functions in your jurisdiction has changed their guidelines the evening before. So uh, an evolving dynamic situation. And as with all things, uh, good communication, in this case with your veterinarian, is absolutely key. So the last thing I want to touch base on is masks. Uh, again, kind of a hot topic right now. Uh, there's a variety of different recommendations by different health organizations as to when you should and shouldn't wear a mask. My takeaway from, from them is mostly based on the WHO guidelines is that there's absolutely no benefit to wearing a mask if you are healthy. Now, remember, surgical masks do not stop viral particle transmission. Uh, they just stop you from spitting on things that are directly in front of you. You know, when you're wearing a mask, uh, unless it is a properly fitted respirator, professionally fitted, which you won't have, if you're a normal member of the public, uh, you're actually drawing air in and out the sides of it. And you know when you're sneezing or coughing, you know the viral particles that you may or may not be sneezing and coughing out are going out the side of the mask and they also can go right through the mask. So the only thing that the mask really stops is droplets of saliva and whatever else you're expelling uh, from traveling directly in front of you. So if you're healthy, wearing a mask is not gonna protect you and it just makes you look silly. And particularly when people wear masks like this, you know, with their nose sticking out, which is, you know, at that point just becomes a really, really ugly fashion accessory. So no point in that. Now, if you are actually sick with COVID-19 or you think you might be sick, then A, you should probably be self-isolating quite rigorously. And B, if you do need to go out, like say to a hospital, then you should wear a mask. Again, it's going to do very little to stop you from spreading the virus. So you shouldn't get overconfident with it, but it'll, it's better than nothing. And hopefully it'll at least keep you from spitting on your healthcare provider as you're talking to them face to face and protect them from your infection. So if you're infected, do wear a mask. It is a minimal, minimal protection to the people around you, but it's still better than nothing. And if you're not infected, then masks aren't going to do anything. You should just maintain social distancing and try to stay at home as much as possible and stay away from people you don't know. Hopefully that'll help you guys a little bit to consolidate this idea in your head as to when it is a and is inappropriate to wear a face mask in public. Uh, and uh, of course, uh, if you are buying face masks, stop 
because they're needed by doctors and veterinarians and nurses and paramedics and people who actually require it. And of course, if you're a healthcare professional, you receive training in your workplace on how to wear a mask. You don't need advice from a YouTube video. Uh, so this is obviously aimed at people who are not healthcare professionals. And just as a closing note, my Facebook has been uh, full of advertisements for anti-pollution masks, these very stylish kind of post-apocalyptic looking masks that look like they have really fancy rubber filters on them. And this is just kind of disgusts me a little bit because clearly uh, this is a company that's trying to capitalize on people's anxieties to sell them masks that probably don't do much. They look like just regular dust masks that have been refitted with a style upgrade. Uh, and uh, honestly, they, they're marketed as anti-pollution masks probably just for liability purposes so they can't be sued afterwards when it's demonstrated their masks are no good at all at preventing illness, which of course none of these masks are. So anyways, these adverts you see popping up for anti-pollution masks, don't spend, don't give those people money. It's just, it, I think it's definitely like an example of profiteering, <laughs> just not very unpleasant. Uh, so yes, that's my video. Uh, please check your news sources, check the World Health Organization, WHO, uh, check the CDC, uh, check your government's healthcare website, wherever you live. Uh, re stick to reputable sources. This is an evolving situation. Things change. If you're watching this video a month from now, a lot may have changed. I will do my best to make update videos if there are any major changes on the animal healthcare front uh, with regard to COVID-19, but obviously uh, it takes a little while for my videos to come out, so they should not be viewed as the most up-to-date news. Uh, but still, I hope that they're useful to you. So for now, if you're lucky enough to have pets in your life, give them a lot of love, give them a lot of care, and uh, stay safe and maintain proper social distancing. Well, I hope you found that to be educational and helpful. Uh, if you'd like to see more videos like this, I would really appreciate your support, which you can express by joining me on Patreon, uh, where I have a wonderful community of patrons already, or by uh, getting some Squish That Cat merchandise, like this t-shirt, I also have mugs and a bunch of other stuff, so please support me. I look forward to making more videos like this, and until next time, have fun with your pets, and I'll see you again.